If you love liberty, declare your independence by signing the Shire Society Declaration at ShireSociety.com. That being said, let's open the public hearing on House Bill 1778, relative to registration of commercial motor vehicles and operator driver's licenses. Welcome, Representative Marble. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And happy new year, everybody. We got a new year here, so we can revisit something that uh, should have been attended to a couple of years ago, but it hasn't. And it's... Uh, something that uh, it has to be made aware to the public who is totally unaware of what their rights are now. And that's the whole purpose of what's here. So let me begin by saying what House Bill 1778 is not. It doesn't charge any taxes. It doesn't change anything that now exists as a statute. The statutes already exist. It doesn't change any Supreme Court rulings which already exist, not only here, but in the three diseases which you will find uh, on this document, which everybody should have now, and it's really a concise, let me read it, a concise in the first paragraph of what we're discussing. The following four pages, which you'll see here, are all court cases throughout the entire country which support the right to travel without interruption from a government official. Government officials are appointed they're not elected like you and I. I'm sorry, I should say it's the officials. We are the officials. We're elected by the people to protect the people from the avarice and greed of the appointed corporate employees of the state government. Now, the state government is a corporation. Part two of our Constitution is the charter of that corporation. We are compelled to take an oath to support and maintain that Constitution. And that Constitution delegates to the government only commercial use of the highway. It's a quote jurisdiction issue. So although this proposal does not change anything that does not already exist, but the public has been continually made unaware of what their rights are. So this is an effort to educate the public into their option. They can continue to pay the town, three or four hundred dollars or whatever it is, there's a town tax on their automobile. Why? There's no tax on consumer goods. Chief Justice Grimes affirmed that in 1967. Do you realize how many millions of dollars that the citizens or inhabitants of this state have paid to a town when they don't have to? Now if you want to, you can contribute but you do not have to and cannot be compelled to pay a tax to the local municipality for your automobile. <laughs> and this is all of the records here that you'll see here. Consumer goods are defined under the UCC as automobile. Automobiles are consumer goods. What for public use? I mean use to travel on the highways. Now there's a difference between a licensed CDL license, commercial. The state has total control over all commercial use of the highways, but they have no jurisdiction over the right to travel, which existed, <laughs> actually existed before governments were formed. Hey, the apes traveled on, on vines between, they moved. The Native Americans, they used canoes, they walked, horseback. The right to travel existed prior to the conception of what is our Constitution, and our Constitution actually incorporates the right to travel by reference there too. Why? Because it existed prior to the government being created. So much for that. Let me read a concise analysis of what is being proposed here to, in, in, let's put it right, to enlighten our inhabitants as to what their rights are. And of course their rights now are being abrogated by the corporate I'm talking about the corporate employees who fail to be accountable. They're supposed to be accountable in Article 8, Article 8 of our Constitution, and I'm a strict constructionist. I took an oath when I joined the military over 50 years ago. And I took an oath, and I never have violated that oath. And I hope you won't violate your oath, as far as what we're concerned with here, because this is what it is. Article 8 says, all power residing in and being derived from the people. All of the magistrates and officers of government, of which we are, are 
accountable as their substitutes and agents and accountable to them. Our corporate employees are not being accountable by virtue of their secrecy in denying the people the option of either registering if they want to, they don't have to, but if they want to, then you're welcome to do so. But you can't compel those who don't want to, to do so. So let me read this. The following four pages of Scarita Cesis. Scarita Cesis is a legal definition of settled court cases. They're all settled. Scarita Cesis all support and confirm the court's determination of the fact that the automobile is defined and classified in our state. The UCC is actually, but the UCC has supremacy in our state as RSA 382A 9-109 as, quote, consumer goods. Not used for commercial purposes, or to make or gain a profit by using the public ways. I say, see, New Hampshire 108, this is Justice Grimes, uh, uh, Supreme, and he was uh, Chief Justice when he wrote this. Uh, see, uh, 108 New Hampshire 386, which you should have a copy of. Is it, if, if I did, it's in the record because I think I did it in the last search. I gave copies of it. But if I didn't, I'll make them available to you. That's so all required. Okay, uh, back to this. Further, the motor vehicle is defined and classified as a self propelled conveyance that uses the public way for profit and or gain, and such commercial use falls within the jurisdiction. That's what the market was, jurisdiction of the state to regulate and to tax such use. It is the distinction between an automobile and a motor vehicle that we're discussing here today, and hopefully you will support, uh, and the difference between automobile and motor vehicles, which in the last session, which unfortunately was tabled, and that's why it's here again today, because the whole, the whole court didn't get a chance to make a decision on this. And in the last session, it was House Bill 598, FN, and it is bringing forth, since it is a duty for the state to disclose these facts to the public before inviting them to enter into a commercial contract of compelled performance, and thus forfeit their right to travel for a taxable privilege. Now that's up to the individual. If they're so inclined to surrender, their right for a taxable privilege is free to do so. And they can do it and have to do it, but they've been doing it unknowingly. Ah, let's see, they're looking at the privilege. And the court has expressed, now this is actual quotation from the court, there could be no sanction or penalty imposed upon one because of his exercise of constitutional rights. And that case is Sheriff versus Cohen and Cullen, and it's in volume 481 of the reports F2D, F is in Frank 2D, and page number 946, 946. And that was in 1973. This is and this here is being submitted under what it really is, the 918 right to know. The people have a right to know. Now, let me continue just briefly. The federal government has defined the motor vehicle as a commercial conveyance. The automobile, to my knowledge, I haven't been able to find it, is not defined by the corporate government in Washington, D.C., familiarly known as the federal government. Because the federal government is completely different from the national government. And I don't want to go into that now because it's unnecessary, but we do have two governments. The corporation is what is running now. And I have coined the term corporate feudalism. When the revolution took place, we severed our feudal ties with a king of England who subsidized and paid for what was the Massachusetts Bay Colony. After the revolution, every one of us or our ancestors became sovereigns without subjects. And all property was allodial property. And the basic government was run by the so-called uh, commercial interests of the entrepreneurs who provided the wealth by business, businessmen, 
and the schools were run by the churches. And that's why Article 6 in the New Hampshire's Constitution is so specific relative to education. But what was interesting, and I gotta take a little sidestep on Article 6 because in 1966, yes, if I may, we have sure. a half hour for the hearing and about 20 minutes of other folks testifying. Okay, so if you and how long have I been on, on, on the, Well, you're still in your range, but you're at the 13 minutes. Have I been, minute. been more than 10 minutes? That, yeah, a little bit. Well, okay, that's another thing I learned. Don't talk too much, because it goes over everybody's head. Okay. So, let me conclude with, I'll let my, my uh, supporters here, you, you all have information uh, before you, documentation, and if you'd like a copy of the Supreme Court, I'll happy to make it for you. But Stop and consider well. At the power of your own conscience, you're either going to support the Constitution or deny our, our citizens our, the, the right to have the choice. Thank you very much. I'll answer any questions anybody has, specific ones. Thank you, Representative Marco. Other questions from the committee? Thank you. Thank you. Procedural note. Representative Dickey, I have a picture <coughs> for you if you intend to testify. Uh, I'm going to speak in favor of my bill, yes. Okay, in that case, you should be in the gallery, not at the, the committee table, please. Wait. Oh, hang on. Sorry. Well, that's, that's for 1348, not for 17. You were being organized. <laughs> Sorry. I'll try to stop that. <laughs> my apologies. No worries. That is, that is the procedure, though. For when that bill comes up, I don't mind sitting at the table and saying it's effectively from every Somebody here? Chairman. Yeah, I do it with my own. Even if I didn't do one for somebody, I just I park myself. All right. Um, it looks like the rest of this will fit close enough. What will happen, though, is if you guys go over and you're testifying, we're going to be seriously late. This year, we recess to the end of our calendar next Tuesday. We have an aggressive schedule today, and I just can't let it get away from us. Next up, Representative McGuire speaking in support of the bill. No, I'm for the next bill. You guys are so <laughs> efficient. <laughs> The schedule's looking better. I should, I should look at the numbers. It's the first day back. Happy New Year. These all say 1778. I'm good now. <laughs> Representative Cummo. Good morning, committee. Okay. Good director, my name is Ed Camo, representing Brookfield, Wakefield, Osby, and FNN. And I'm just going to cut to the chase here. Um, the Uniform Commercial Code is not some mystical, pseudo-legal codification. It's real, and the state is not following those laws. So when you make your decision, just make sure that you research the Uniform Commercial Code, the statute that New Hampshire has already um, passed to say they'll actually follow it, and that's all in the testimony. It needs to be, the state needs to follow the codes. Very model of efficiency and brevity. Thank you. Had another hand. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next up is Jim McKinley. Thank you. Pleasure to be with, with all of you folks this morning. Uh, I'm Jim McKinley from Middleton, New Hampshire, and I'm speaking in support of the bill. And what I'd like to do is just quote a few things from a monograph that was put out by Jack McLam, oh, probably 20 years ago. And for those of you who don't know him, he was a Phoenix police officer. When he died in 2014, he was known as the most decorated police officer in the state of Arizona. Um, and his <coughs> monograph, by the way, I passed out, so you all have a full copy of it. I'd just like to pull a couple things here. So, for years, professionals within the criminal justice system have acted on the belief that traveling by motor vehicle was a privilege that was given to a uh, citizen, citizen only after approval by the state government. In other words, the individual must be granted the privilege before the use of the state highways was considered legal. Legislatures, police officers, and court officials are becoming aware that there are court decisions that disprove the belief of driving is a privilege and therefore requires government approval. And, uh, 
in the package, I've also given you something like uh, five dozen citations from court cases, all supporting the right to travel. So as Representative Marshall said, this is scared diseases. This has all been decided in the past. A couple of citations are very, very uh, pointed to this. The right to operate a motor vehicle upon the public streets and highways is not a mere privilege. It is a right of liberty, the enjoyment of which is protected by the guarantees of the federal and state constitution. This is from the case Adams versus the city of Pocatello. Second one, travel is not a privilege requiring licensing, which registration or forced insurances. That's from Chicago Coach Co Company versus the uh, city of Chicago. Uh, so basically, the, the beliefs of our state legislatures and so on, and the courts and so on, uh, have uh, acted upon all these years have been in error. Research, researchers armed with actual facts state that the case law is overwhelming in determining that, the, that to restrict the movement of the individual in the free exercise of his right to travel is a serious breach of those freedoms secured by the U.S. Constitution and most state constitutions. That means, basically, it's just unlawful. Okay. So, I guess, given the preponderance of evidence, uh, one, you have to ask yourself, we all have to ask ourselves, is there any moral or lawful reason that this bill should not be passed? Think about that as you're considering this. And as Representative Marple said, the people were unaware, and I think he's correct, they were unaware but there is a phenomenal exponential increase in awareness in the public these days. And if you see what's going on, and you know uh, uh, President Trump's uh, executive order and the thousands of sealed indictments that are reported to be there, I think things are changing real fast. And we have an opportunity to set things right here with this bill. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Thank you. Questions from the committee. Representative St. Clair. Thank you. Can you, uh, I, you lost me in that last statement. You said things are changing. Can you elaborate a little on that? Because I'm, what, what, what are you saying with regards to this bill? Things are changing. From and you mentioned President Trump. What I was saying was things are changing in general, and that includes things like people's rights that have been uh, subverted. So you're saying President Trump would support? Is there this a follow-up question? I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I'll get this straight. Yes. Yeah. Are you willing to say it? Thank you. I'm making a broad statement that things are changing all over the place. Okay. And this, this, I'm sure you'll find, will be included in it. Okay. Already, people know that this, this is unlawful to have to have a driver's license and a registration. Many people know it. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Next up is Ms. Crawford. <laughs> I am here to support this bill and hope that you will um, vote um, uh, to pass on it. Uh, I don't need your protection for one thing. I would hope that um, governmental bodies would keep their protection to uh, invaders of the borders and things like that. And, um, you know, so that's one part. And I also support the absurd notion that people should be able to move freely in the land of the free, in the free or, live free or die state. And my hope is that some of you will be daring enough to support this bill. Uh, it would, it would um, let's see. I believe this, is, this falls under the notion what, what um, President Reagan said, we're here from the government. I mean, what's in place now is falls under that. This would would pulse, would would give us more freedoms, and and I believe what we have now is um, we're here from the government and we're here to help. So if you fail this bill, that's what I think you'll be doing. You'll be from the government and you're going to be helping. <laughs> so uh, my hope is you'll support it, and um, I know it's daring to support um, certain bills and. And I hope some of y'all step up and do that. That's what I got. Does anybody want to ask me anything? <laughs> questions from the committee? Mm -hmm. so Thank you. Done. Thank you. Director Bailecki. Thank you.
Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back. It is good to see all of you and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. For the record, Elizabeth Bielaki, I am Director of Motor Vehicles. And yes, I do have a stack of cards for today. <laughs> I'm trying to uh, plan ahead, but I will hold them until then. Thanks. I get confused easily. <laughs> um, this morning, I would like to speak in opposition to HB 1778. Uh, I believe all of you have the fiscal note that the department has prepared in front of you. And not only will this bill have a significant revenue impact, reducing state revenues by a little over $100 million each fiscal year, and municipal revenues by over $250 million each fiscal year, but more importantly, this, this bill really will have a significant safety impact on all of us on all of the residents of the state, as well as the visitors and those that come on vacation in the state. The bill proposes a repeal of a number of provisions that are currently in the statute, including the driver licensing provision, so only those driving commercial motor vehicles would be required to hold a license. So in essence, there would be no need to test anyone to ensure that they are a fit driver. There would be really no way to suspend or revoke any, uh, anybody's driver's license. So there will be no way to enforce um, those people that some of us would consider unfit drivers. So those individuals would now be allowed to be on the road without any type of privilege or card that would allow them to continue that. In addition, the bill also repeals the provision that re requires the registration of motor vehicles. So from a law enforcement perspective, it would be really problematic for public safety as there would be no way of identifying vehicles potentially involved in crime, stolen vehicles, and so forth. You would merely be going on the year, make, and model potentially in the color of the vehicle, but there would be no other identifying information for police officers to be able to pursue those vehicles involved in crimes. I could go on, but in the interest of time, I will stop right here. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Thank you, Director. I have a question. If we were to pass this and I decide not to get a driver's license, well, I, I wouldn't be able to get one, would I? Mm -hmm. If I also wanted car insurance, would I still be able to get it? I'm not sure if I can speak to that. Um, I, I am not so sure how, what that would mean uh, for insurance okay. purposes. Fair enough. Representative Hornets. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question. Um, would we be able to enjoy reciprocity with the other states? So, for example, if I don't need a driver's license in New Hampshire, would I be able to then travel to Massachusetts and uh, not be beholden to their licensing requirement? I don't believe you would be able to do that. I, I believe that if you entered another state without a valid privilege to drive in another state, you would be subject to sanctions, being stopped, being arrested for driving without a license in that state. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Horn. You did uh, take my question. I thought that was very good because I, I do understand there is a compact that Nashua, uh, not Nashua, but New Hampshire is in with other states and the reciprocity of all the laws and stuff like that. And I could pro possibly see this affecting that. But down to get down to my question, I heard in some of the testimony, is anybody stopping the free will of people to drive in this state to operate their motor vehicle? Is there? on guys on the highway or anything else like that to stop free travel at all? Currently? Yes, sir. Yes, there is. There is I one person testifying right now. Thank you. Okay, no, well, he asked the question. I think That's so. not how it works here. Thanks. Not that I am aware of. Thank you. Representative Dick. <coughs> Director, what does the right to travel mean? From this bill's perspective? From, from the point of view of the, it's a constitutional right to travel, I think that is well established. What does that mean? The director is not a constitutional lawyer. Hmm. Given, she's the head of the Department of Motor Vehicles. Uh, right. Here, well, respectively. And her job description does not require her to be a legal scholar. Hmm. She works for the commission as in the state, and we have three minutes left. I believe that would be about a 25 minute answer if done briefly. Okay. Representative True, and we have three minutes left in this hearing, and one person would still like to speak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for taking my question, Director. If this were to pass, how would you differentiate between uh, consumer goods? Say somebody, say me driving my car as as a consumer good, and then going to work in my car. How would the state? How would the state divide? Anyway, I'm dividing that? 
usual way, but not that one. I don't believe there would be, uh, other than enforcement and determining the, the, the purpose of your travel, there would really be no other way of identifying that, um, according to the bill. And again, I'm not sure the intent of the bill would be to determine whether you are traveling to or from work. This is for commercial purposes only, so you would have to use your vehicle for commercial purposes. Other questions? Thank you, Director. Thank you. Ian Good morning. I wanted to address the question of the armed guards. Yes, there are armed guards First, on the roads. Name, and if you represent anyone for the rest. Oh, sorry about that. I figured your introduction would be all right. It's the new year. Uh, Ian Freeman, uh, one of the co-chairs of the New Hampshire Liberty Party. So to answer the question about the armed guards, yes, they're known as the state police. Uh, they are all over the, the roads, and they will absolutely put somebody in a jail cell and a prison cell for driving around without a government permission slip. I know people who've gone to, uh, to prison in New Hampshire because they were suspended and operating while suspended. Now that doesn't mean that they're dangerous. That just means in one case, uh, I was in jail for civil disobedience a few years ago and I met somebody who was in there for an entire year uh, on a minimum sentence because he got a ticket in Massachusetts in the 1990s, a $50 ticket that he never paid. And, you know, he just got enough violations here in New Hampshire to where he was driving to work. He wasn't drunk <coughs> or anything like that. He was going to work at his job at Bickford's to try to support his family as a manager at a restaurant. And he had to go to jail for an entire year because of that. I know another guy who went to prison in New Hampshire for two, a two-year sentence uh, on one of these things. So we see the way that the state enforces these ridiculous rules. I mean, the, the fear-mongering from the, uh, the person from the uh, Department of Transportation, it's completely unnecessary. The idea that uh, the licensing process stops people from driving is ridiculous. Uh, and we see it all the time. The guy who was in prison was shocked at how many people were in there for driving. Uh, to me, if you've got a prison, that should be a place for dangerous people, murderers, rapists, arsonists, that seems like a place for, you know, for those folks. But people who are driving, uh, anyway, that's what I have to say about that. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Questions from the committee? Seeing none, we have St. Clair. You, would you consider, I understand you're thinking about people, you know, dangerous, not dangerous, but would you consider uh, untrained drivers on the road to be a danger to other drivers on the road? Well, certainly that would be a danger, yeah. Okay. Um, but the government licensing process doesn't, you know, that doesn't prevent people from getting behind the wheel of a car and driving somewhere. Look at all the DUIs. By the way, when I was in uh, jail for civil disobedience, the people who were in there for DUI were there for 21 or 30 days, whereas this other guy was there for a year because he drove to work completely safely. Thanks. All right. Mr. Chairman, before you ham it, let me have about another minute, please. I'm sorry. Second bite at the apple. Because I was arrested last year, twice. Representative Markle, if we were under time, you know me, I would happily say yes, but the hearing ended. Well, today. I mean, just the end. Uh, are you going to bring the gavel now? I am about to because the next hearing is. There's somebody else to speak. Because the next hearing is beginning one minute ago. <laughs> okay. If anybody's interested, it's all on video. The four video. In fact, uh, Mr. Freeman here is the one who videoed it on uh, all of the four cases which were in the Clanket Court. <laughs> Incidentally, uh, I was I was found innocent of driving without a license. I said I'm not going to take it. I don't appreciate that. And if anyone's wondering what my attitude is about today, our colleagues have seen fit to send this committee 48 bills, and we will process them in eight days because a lot of the members of this committee have jobs and other commitments, so we can't come in here two, three days a week. There are literally eight days to process all of those. We will do our public hearings, we will do our research, we will do our voting and process them out in eight days. So we're not going to run over on any of these hearings today. That closes that hearing. As soon as the clerk is ready, we will begin the public hearing. We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.